Sustainability isn't good enough. We can't sustain and expect to survive in the current state that we're in in our agriculture. We have to do better. We have to regenerate. Our conventional agriculture today is about depletion. How long can we live on this soil before it actually can't produce anymore? If we lose our soil, we've lost everything. We're depleting our ability to create food that can nourish us. And I don't know what's more fundamental than that. I, mean, I don't know what else we could possibly work on that's bigger then regenerating our soil, and then regenerating our health. My name is Walker Kerr, and I'm from Pacific Palisades, California. At Stanford University, I have a Bachelor's of Science and Master's of Science in Earth Systems, and I studied specifically climate change and alternative energy. I did internships and I sat at a desk, but I would come into work and like 20 minutes in, I'd be like, all right, when do I get to go home? Like, this, uh, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. It's very easy to look out here and see these cattle and think that we're just raising grass-fed beef, it's just going to stores and it's, it's being eaten, that's, that's all that's happening. But there's a lot going on underneath the ground which you can't see, so it's important for people to know that it's more than just raising healthy beef, which is a big part of this equation. The other half of it is what we're doing to help the plant at the same time. We're looking at the proof for why grazing in rangelands or croplands can reverse climate change. And there's a lot of data out there showing how much organic carbon you can be sequestering into the soil by growing grass. And this is because when we're sending the cattle out here in these pastures to go and, and graze, we want them to take that bite of the grass that forces the plant to go through the photosynthetic process, pull down carbon out of the atmosphere and into the soil to regrow that plant. Now that carbon somewhat goes into growing the plant, but there's a lot pulled in that stays stored in the soil. On a single acre, per these strategies, you can add as much as three or four tons of organic carbon per year. One ton of organic carbon relates to 3.67 tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. That is a significant amount when we're talking about we need to sequester millions of tons of CO2 to affect climate change. It's a very simple thing there to say that. Obviously, it's not that easy. You have to really manage well. That's a key word to this whole thing is that you have to manage the grazing of these cattle because rest is very key to letting those plants regrow and pulling that carbon into the ground before you graze it again. Ultimately, we want to trample a third, eat a third, and leave a third. If we leave a third, there's enough there for photosynthesis to start very efficiently without drawing too much energy out of the root system. If we trample a third, that helps cover the soil and keep the soil temperature down. Then that plant breaks down into organic matter in the soil. And if we eat a third, of course, the animals are full and, and happy. Where our farm is, any area that wasn't suitable for tilling and growing a grain crop was fenced and used as pasture. Now that's called set grazing, where you have an area, you put the animals in for the growing season, you don't move them, they just eat what's there. That in and of itself isn't very good for the land. So not everything old the way it was was necessarily great. We've put together a patchwork of those old pastures on those farms, but we rotate cattle through those. So they go in at a higher density, they'll spend a day or two on that pasture, and then we move them and allow that land to rest and regenerate the plants that go with it. In the meantime, the cattle are fertilizing the land, their hoof action on the land helps the soil and helps the seeds in the seed bed to germinate. Even the saliva from the cattle we've learned recently 
has a positive biological impact on the soil itself. I know that there's what I would say the, a myth around cattle being bad, but when you read the research that goes into the positive impacts that cattle have on the land when they're managed properly, which ultimately leads to grass-fed beef, we are being very myopic if we're saying cattle are the problem. Because if you take cattle out of the picture and you take grazing out of the picture of agriculture, you're missing the opportunity for so many benefits, which at the root of it, no pun intended, is rebuilding the soil. Feedlots are absolutely the reason why we have these negative thoughts about cattle. There are consumers confusing feedlots with grass-fed beef and thinking it's all kind of the same. There is zero similarities between these two systems, except that there are cattle both on them and that you have black hided animals out there. We've learned that we can grow our soil, we can make our biodiversity better, we can build those things up and not just keep them at a certain way, we can make them better while also growing food for us. If we're gonna feed people going forward, I mean, it, it, you kinda have to change your mindset about how things are growing. I mean, constantly throughout time, we have to shift our mindset. It can't always stay the same. One of the things that really befuddles me is why we would wanna take our soil and put it into our gas tanks. All that value of that soil and everything that it represents, we're taking our food system we're taking our future food and putting it in our gas tanks through corn. It makes no sense and we should really stop doing it. Conventional ag, what's the maximum yield I can get out of one monoculture crop? How many bushels of corn can I get out of this land? Versus in regenerative, what we're thinking about is how do I build this soil so that it's productive as far as we can see into the future? If we didn't manage this land the same way, and let's say it was tilled and put in GMO corn, they would have 10, 20 great years of crops. But every year, they'd be depleting that soil. And that, in essence, is what we're doing with our conventional egg in this wonderful topsoil that we have in the corn belt. We're depleting it. And that wonderful topsoil came from a lot of organic matter. It came from ruminants grazing. It came from great practices before we started tilling and providing a lot of inputs on the soil. That soil still has that potential, but we need to regenerate it back and build on it every year. When you drive through Iowa, the corn state right now, it's really hard to find animals outdoors. You see a farm, you see a large tin building, you don't see the animals, but you know they're in that building. And in the fields, you see rows and millions of acres of corn. What I imagine is that those animals could come out of the metal building, be on those fields, and regenerating that soil that's so deep and rich in Iowa. And why not? And we take that times a thousand producers, and we take that across millions of acres in this country, now we're saving ourselves as a society and we're having a big impact. One of our biggest missions and one of our biggest benefits to our holistic grazing practices here is to regenerate topsoil. A lot of the land that we're taking over here to graze has been rotated with corn and soybeans for 50, 60 years. And one of the measures that we look at the most is organic matter percentage. Because we know that if we increase the organic matter by a single percent, 
the water holding capacity of an acre increases by 20,000 gallons. So we're gonna fold some soil over here and see what it looks like. The soil is dry, but yet it isn't completely falling apart. It's holding together with the root systems and the organic matter helps to hold this like a sponge together. We are netting positive in our organic matter three to four ton per acre per year. So that is a tangible measurement of building soil. If you are tilling and planting a monoculture and not having the ground covered, we know that you lose eight to 10 ton of topsoil per acre per year. So that's how dramatic these practices are and why we should really have more land grazed, more land covered with grasslands so that we can turn around this cycle of depleting soil and instead regenerate the soil. It's not that hard. It's simple. It's this right here. That's all I got. Take my shovel and go home. When I think of America as a whole and agriculture, we've had this trend towards fewer and fewer farmers, and that has coincided with these bigger and bigger, more corporate farms that are growing corn or soybeans or some other grain or a very large feedlot, that isn't really getting anybody closer to the land. If we want to preserve our rural economy, I believe we really need to look at how do we reward people to stay in a rural economy. If you think of the counseling you go through when you're going to get married, finances is one of the number one stressors in a relationship. And it's no different than farming. And sometimes when we have to buy everything, we need equipment to do this, we need equipment to do that, we need to get feed inputs, we need to buy this, we need to do that. Pretty soon there is so much stress there that it takes the fun out of farming. So when I first started farming, you have to realize I was working off the farm. So then I'd work during the day and farm during the night. And yes, I do have scars because one isn't made to work all day and all night. We were calving early during the first of February. Then at calving season, I would be up every three hours checking cows. Then you're caring for calves in the snow. They were implanted for your growth hormones. They were um, fed feed additives. We had cattle within 12 months that would be processed. It was always pushing the animals to, to grow faster and to be better than the person next to you. You were trying to work against Mother Nature. And looking at it now, the animals aren't created for that. And I'm not made to push that hard. With the new way of farming, it's my way of staying in the cattle business and being able to stay productive and yet hold to my integrity of what my beliefs because of different things that have happened to me health-wise over the years to realize that I want to do something to raise a product that, that is different than the norm. My desire was always to be a farmer, but I enjoy it much more now. And there's a sense of appreciation to see the ground to come alive and just to see how you can wake a pasture up. On the farm, we try to do as much soil testing as possible. For the ground, it's no different than our bodies. If our bodies are missing one thing, that's why we buy supplements to meet the needs. So with the soil, it's the same way. If there's something lacking, we need to correct it so that it can collect that solar energy in, and put it in the forages. So your basics is your, your, your phosphorus and potash. But then the micros would be your magnesium, calcium, sulfur, zinc, manganese, iron, copper, 
And the number one thing to start with is the, the pH. And the pH is how acidic your soil is. There's a cutoff at like 6.5. Anything below that, it's tough for anything to really grow very well at all. The closer to seven, the better. This soil, we, we added a, a lot of lime and ash to it as the product that we used. And in the, the results, as you, you see, we went from 5.6 to 7.5. With getting these results back, it helps us to put the whole picture together for benefiting the animals. It's exciting when you want your animals to do better, to get the grasses going better, and then if the grasses are doing better, then the bugs on the ground increase, and it's just a, it's a snowball effect that's headed in the right direction. You have to realize I love working with cows. <laughs> Not that you guys aren't nice to work with, okay? If you would ask anybody in the house or anybody that knows me, yes, I am a kid on the inside. But sometimes you do take life seriously and you need things to relieve the pressure. Georgia of the jungle, look out for that tree! We all look at life differently, and I choose to farm in a way that's different than many others. And I can't condemn them for the way they farm. We all make decisions, and we all um, have to live with ourselves. I'm not saying my way is right or someone else's way is right or wrong, but I know for myself, I feel good when I lay down at night that I do things the way I do. If we value anything to do with our rural economy and value the land, then I think we have to keep American agriculture alive. And not just American agriculture conventionally, but American agriculture in a regenerative sense. How as a nation do we want to manage that land? Do we want to manage it by spraying it with glyphosate or putting on petroleum-based fertilizers that burn the soil? Is that how we want to manage our land? in our country? Or do we want to take a closer look and say, maybe I want to support those family farms that are really working to regenerate the soil that we all depend on? I love the animals and I love farming. And there's nothing better than to hear those birds starting to talk in the morning and to see the light coming up. Man, oh man. It just makes a guy light up on the inside. Remember that life created our soils. It created our atmosphere. It created ocean chemistry. It created at least 10% of the surface rocks of the Earth's crust. What we consider the mineral environment of life in many ways is the creation of life. It's a feedback loop. And this is why it doesn't work with so much of our input-output mechanical decision-making. Because we're part of the circle of life. The soil aggregate is the fundamental infrastructure of our civilization. Maybe a lot of us don't understand what a civilization is. If we think of it as a collection of things like McDonald's and a university and a police department, it's the whole complex of human activities and human communities. And that depends upon the soil. And without that, our infrastructure of steel, concrete, asphalt goes away from floods and our economies fail because of drought and we starve to death. And how do people starve to death? They die by drowning in the Mediterranean. No! They die from cholera. They die from epidemic diseases. They die from violence. And we see that happening already. We have to regenerate. We have to get our soils back to where they were 200 years ago. 
and even better than that. We can do that now. A lot of these things that we practice out here are nothing new. It's just putting them together and thinking about them in a different way. How are you affecting the wildlife? How are you affecting your water system? How are you affecting the people that are raising this stuff? Are they happy and healthy? Are they getting time off? Are they making a profit? I want to show that you can make a good living doing what you love out here while also benefiting the planet and raising something healthily. It's kind of against the grain and there's satisfaction in that. I am so thankful for today and just to be able to, to be on this piece of ground and be able to have the opportunity to care for it. And when I leave this earth, I, I, I pray that I leave it in better shape than when I came here. There's a certain glue that ties us all together, I think, that are involved in this, that we have a hope for the future. We have a sense we're making a difference. We know we're in a battle. There's a lot of dollars working against us, but we're grassroots and we're resilient. We really believe in what we're doing. And there's a lot of passion around that, that dollars can't necessarily overcome. Every one of these people, every one of them that are involved in this is a renegade. And I call them regenerative renegades because they're swimming against the current. <laughs>